Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Uh, we are now live on Twitch and we are live on YouTube. Hope everybody's doing well. We got uh, the Stug Master joining us on the show here in a little bit. I uh, wanted to get started a little early, like I always do, about 10 minutes early. <clears throat> hey, there he is. Yeah. What's going on? Can you I got me? my uniform on. Awesome, dude. Looks good. Yeah. What? Uh, can you hear me good? Yeah. Sweet. All right, guys. Uh, we got a real Civil War buff here. Now, he just yeah. got back from Gettysburg, guys. I'm just glowing with, with Civil War -ness. He's like... <laughs> the, pain, the painting is good. He's gone deep, deep. He's deep diving. Uh, and I see you're still working on this... Uh, Epic, right? The epic. Yep. The yep. yep. Right now, right now, I'm. Uh, my hands are really shaky. I just picked up the brush, and uh, but um, yeah, I'm working right now. I'm working on a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff right now. What I'm trying to do is uh, is uh, do the whole Irish Brigade as kind of like the first brigade, you know, that I do of hopefully several. I'd like like to say that and have it become true, but you never know. But uh, yeah. All right. Hey, good to see Gaslight Studio is in the house. Um, glad you're doing well. Oh, nice. Yeah, those are not good, man. Yeah, good job. Yeah, something like that. I just need to uh, get the grass. I just ordered some special grass, like one millimeter. I, I'm thinking we'll we'll do the trick, maybe maybe two from uh, WWS or WW Scenics or something like that over in the UK. So it's gonna take a while to get here and then i got some flags from uh 15 millimeter flags from gmb designs so yeah i i i went with them i think i think they're gonna be pretty good uh pretty good flags which the flags that they give you uh the standard flag size is around six feet to six feet and a half mm -hmm. on both on you know length and width right. so and the ones on there are absolutely atrocious, um, <laughs> absolutely atrocious. When it comes to the size, I mean, it the they're a little uh, blurry, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I notice it's, it's kind of it's kind of got like a like a cloudiness to it, like like the color is just really weird on them. They don't really pop, you know. Which those flags were meant to pop. That's the role of them, you know. Right. Um, and. Uh, yeah, they're just the sizes are completely, absolutely wrong. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that that the flags can be tough. I've run into that with uh, the Black Seas flags for the ships in Black Seas. Yeah, yeah it's kind of my Perry. I mean, I it is all Warlord games. It's it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, the Perry's I got with my Perry kits for my Napoleonics I'm working on. Oh, good. They're pretty good. They're pretty they're good. They're, they're pretty thick. vibrant. Yeah, they're thick, but they're vibrant though. But that's what they're supposed to be. You right. Know? Because we're talking, these flags were made of of silks and elaborate colors. You know, yep. when they started making the first Confederate flags, the not the stars and bars, but the battle flags, though. Um, you know, they were trying to get as much scarlet as possible, silk, and they started running out. So they had to resort to hot pink and pinks and all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. um, when they start, first started coming out. So I mean, these these flags were, you know, even with battle damage, it's still it's these silk beautiful you know beautifully painted stuff and uh yeah well cool uh one of the things i want to get started off uh with right here we're right at the four o'clock uh, hour we should be getting more people coming in but uh, we're going to start off the show uh tonight guys or this afternoon with uh uh uh, Stug's going to talk about his recent trip to Civil War. I have uh, several questions. I was there in 2019 with my friend Rob. We were there for a short time. We were mainly there to go to Cold Wars 2019, but we stopped at Antietam first in the you early afternoon. Uh, kind of around the autumn or winter, right? Yeah, or we were there uh, actually yeah. around March, so the oh, leaves yeah. hadn't come on yet. So it looked, everything looked dead. Yes, I, that's what I remember. That's why I was. Yeah. And the advantage to that, I think, just like our guy on the History Underground, um, he, he has a great YouTube channel. We'll get to that here later in the show. But I was watching him all morning. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. He, 
I, I tell you, if you can, if uh, guy, if you guys want to go when it's not crowded and it's not hot, if you go in the late fall or you know the early spring, like I was, or late winter, technically, um, the weather wasn't bad at all. And I tell you, man, we had the run of the place. I mean, it was deserted. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it made a huge impact on me. I remember, uh, my first time there, he said, what's the first place you want to go, Al? Uh, he, Rob had been there you know, many times and I said, uh, you know, little round top, of course. <laughs> and, uh, so that was a first, well, we started the devil's den and then we w- went up, uh, from there, but, uh, we'll get to uh, gaslight studios had a question already. Uh, what's your favorite ACW battle or campaign to war game? And uh, I would say, just hold on. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. It's uh, another topic of the show today. But uh, we're now hitting the four o'clock hour. Uh, Anybody coming in a little later um, is going to just have to watch the replay. Guys, you can also watch this on replay on Twitch. If you're a Twitch fan, if you play games on Twitch, uh, we're trying to... Twitch is expanding. It's been expanding out into uh, talk shows and chats and all kinds of things. It's not all just... uh, you know, hot girls with big boobs and hot tubs, right? It's not yeah. all uh, everybody uh, playing video games. We're trying to introduce onto Twitch some other genres, uh, and I think Twitch is really trying to promote that and get away from the the stereotype. But it's good to have another yeah, platform. Cracking down on it. Right, they're really cracking down on it. So they're uh, <clears throat> they're uh, trying to expand uh, the topics and things you're seeing some auto stuff and all kinds of other topics so definitely check out twitch guys if you're anti youtube um, you're anti alphabet abc alphabet even though they're one of the largest corporations in the world now up there with amazon <laughs> if you're a if you're a stock person but uh, yeah, it's uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not seeing anything on Twitch as far as uh, censorship, unless you're doing you know something ridiculous on there. Um, or you like, yeah, <laughs> give them time. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I know, like I said, my first trip to Gettysburg, I w- had a, it was made a huge impact on me. We went into Gettysburg to have dinner, and we sat down, ordered a couple drinks. And Rob looked at me and said, what do you think? And I said, dude, I'm like numb. <laughs> I'm literally like numb because for me, I've always been a very uh, a person that follows my instincts. I try to follow my instincts and I, I, I typically can uh, feel myself getting in touch when I go to historical places like Williamsburg and you know, Fort Boonesboro. I could really, uh, I guess you could say I, I got some kind of sensitivity to the to picking up off of history. And that was a place, man, it was just resonating hard. Um, you could really feel, um, you could feel it. So what was, when you first, where was the, the very first place when uh, you and your um, your beautiful woman got there together and you went to the very first place? I saw your first, I watched all your videos on it. I encourage you guys to go over that. Thank you. What, what was your first uh the very first place you parked, I think, was over there by Lee's headquarters, wasn't it? Yes. Um, so I would say if you want to like, really like the first place I went to without a camera and everything, because I I was I went there planning on to kind of go around the battlefield and do what I did. Um, but the first place I went was the visitor center. That's a great place to kind of yep. get into the mood. I remember it uh um we we kind of mess around the town the first day we were there mm-hmm. you know and go to the, some of the shops and do stuff like that uh and then the next day in the morning we went to the visitor center and i remember the first night staying there it was it was really weird i was i just couldn't really click with my brain like that i'm in gettysburg because i've been wanting to go there since well since forever. Great. Learned, yeah uh, since i've I went there as a, as a kid and, uh, you know, I never got to be, I was never able to go back there when I graduated from high school for my senior trip and everything. So it was really surreal. And uh, actually, uh, for like the next couple of days, I didn't, it wasn't clicking with me until I got on the battlefield and I started seeing those monuments mm-hmm. and, and following the, the steps of where they were deployed and everything. That's when I was starting to get into it. Uh, the first place I went was the visitor center just because it has the museum. Uh, 
which is a great introduction. It's amazing. Uh, they yeah. did an amazing job on that. Yeah, it's a, yeah, beautiful museum. The artifacts when you get in there before you get in the museum are awesome. Uh, then they, um, of course, they take you through all three days of the battle and also begin uh, pre and post Gettysburg. Uh, and then they, if you uh, want, you can buy the extra ticket and go and see the uh, um, the movie. There's like a little film that's, uh, yeah. I would say, maybe like 20 minutes long or something like that. Just kind of wraps up uh, the Civil War and what it's doing. Of course, uh, the slavery in the beginning and it kind of builds the foundation and then it goes into the campaign. Uh, so that's really, really good uh, to kind of, you know, dip your feet, your toe into in the beginning before you hit the battlefield and stuff. And then they have the cyclorama, which is this amazing mm -hmm. painting that was painted by, a, uh, I believe, a veteran of the battle uh, there during Pickett's Charge. And that's what it depicts is Pickett's Charge. Uh, yeah. And it's just all around you. You, you, you pop up uh, from a spiral stair staircase and then all you get up there to this plateau and you see all around you and it's this amazingly huge painting. I mean, I, I forget the di the dimensions for it, but it is absolutely huge. And you can see 360 all around you of pick and starch happening. Um, and of course, if you know your stuff, you could point out, Oh, that's Hancock over there. Hey, that's Gibbons, uh, you know, or so, and so, Hey, there's Armistead right there. Uh, and it's really cool. Uh, and then they play like behind the painting. They have some uh, pyrotechnics, something like that. Whatever right. the word, whatever the word is. Sound effects and, and all that. Yeah, there's, uh, they'll do the lighting and everything. Right. So start. It's really cool because they start off. There's a narrator. Uh, the July first in the morning. Blah 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 blah. And it becomes really dark. And then you see in the painting off in the distance behind you, it uh, the sun rising. It starts getting a little blue out. Then it starts getting a little, uh, uh, some pinks and stuff, and the, and you see the sunrise, and then it takes you what's going on on that third day during Pickett's Charge, and the cannonball, boom, boom. Of course, the speakers are really loud, and, and the fighting is going on. You're watching these paintings, which the paintings are just, uh, the, there's so much stuff going on and nitty-gritty, and it's, it's cool knowing that the guy who painted it was there. So you know this is what he was seeing and how chaotic it, it was and plus he actually put himself where he was <laughs> during the biggest charge in the painting so that's pretty cool yeah awesome yeah i mean and they had a great collection too right outside the cyclorama the of, of the weapons that yep. had been picked up off the battlefield guns we're talking shells balls, buttons just everything. everything yeah a button collection um so if you're a button counter and a, a button fanatic on uh, your uniform painting <laughs> You can definitely need to go to Gettysburg's yeah. museum. You'll have all the buttons you want to look at and what colors they really are. And then you uh, walk forward to the horse holder and know and understand the prices of of everything that's there. Right. <laughs> well, and you know, then you, you that's a great place to start. We went straight to the battlefield and then we went to the um, to the museum, uh, but um, we kind of went a little backwards on that. But um, but yeah, I mean it's. If you haven't been, guys, you have to go. Um, it, I'll tell you when when Stug was there. That's it's really a, um, amplifies the conditions of the battle with with the heat and the humidity. Um, here it, in Ohio, yeah. here I in still Ohio, remember going there in, in March, and it was nothing like going there during the anniversary. Right, the, the heat is so. I mean, we have humidity here in the Pacific Northwest, but it's without that. Uh, we don't have that heat though. You know, right. and Boy, oh boy, that was that was yeah. something else. You know, I put this on and and uh, yeah, it just it's insane. Just tells you, I've worked in it for thirty one years, so I get you know you get used so to you're it. You're used to it. You're tuned. So the trick yeah. is, you if we get out early, from Yankee like me, six and seven, and you let your body acclimate. Yeah, it's not as bad. And I noticed how you were doing that a lot of the days, which is very morning, smart. Okay. Gets in the mornings are nice until you get about eleven ish. We get the same thing here in the high river valley, and guys, this is the unique thing of geography. 50, 50, 50 turns. Yeah, I mean, that, that so in a river valley like that, and we're between the Allegheny Mountains and the ocean there, that traps the heat just like it does here in the Ohio River Valley. So, but you know, you can swing too. It's really odd 
these micro, what we call in, in the agriculture industry is microclimates. So we'll get these microclimates where one day it could be 95 and the next day it could be 60. So it just so happened when they were fighting the battle 158 years ago, the, uh, he was there for the uh, anniversary guys is, uh, it was around 90. You got a taste of what those guys dealt with, with the lack of water, the, the, the heat exhaustion, the, you know, he really adds another dimension to, uh, the Southerners marching long march to get up there and get everyone up there. And they were just, I can't even imagine, uh, what they were going through mentally. Cause after you get so hot, when I was younger in this field, I would, I thought I was Mr. Invincible. I would stay out all day, you know, working until the evening, you know, trying to establish my business. And there were times where it was, you almost get a, like a little delirious. You almost, you, you're not even thinking straight. You're just like a robot, you know, you're just moving, doing your job and you're not even really thinking <laughs> because by the end of the day, that heat just sucks you dry. I mean, there's just noth- nothing left other than robotic, uh, activity. <laughs> so it really highlights, um, any in, battles that we fight. Emotion. Right. So, uh, what was, uh, what was, what would you say? One of the things that when you were there and one of the things that I appreciated about your videos was you took, I mean, you paid the, uh, what's the word I want to say? You, uh, uh, paid your dues. You were, uh, in the trenches, you were walking the entire battle line all the way down so you could really get a sense of the topography especially but what was a place you came upon that just hit you there was something that hit you that really made a huge impact on you where where would you say that was on the battlefield um probably again it was probably the um a little bit of McPherson's Ridge when I when I just started. So we hit the 13th uh, Main, maybe or something. And when I went over that ridge for the first time, and that was it was like late in the evening. I just got there. That was like the second day we were there. We did the visitor center stuff, and I was like, okay, I got to get on the battlefield. It's late at night, but I got to get on the battlefield. And then that's that's kind of what I was like, man, we're here. Like here's, and I and I bet you you can probably hear it in the video. Mm-hmm. Um, in that first one because i'm like this is where their right flank was and then down here yep yep they're right there there's the left flank and everything i don't really do that that much in the later videos i don't think i do like i can't believe i'm standing where i've been reading about and studying about exactly watching documentaries about and here i am standing here yes that wild i'd probably say that happened um well, definitely the Confederate lines. Definitely. Uh, that was something walking that whole stretch. Cause it took, I think it was like around four and a half hours or something to walk to one side and there and back. And I don't mm-hmm. even think I did the full length. Cause I start, I went from, uh, um, uh, not the Amherstburg road. Uh, well, basically the start of Confederate Avenue. Um, and I, I don't, I don't even think the Confederates were that, were actually farther than that. They were across the road and even towards McPherson's Ridge, maybe, or something like that. You know, at least some of the stuff from the first day. Uh, but yeah, going through AP Hills core and long streets core, that was, that was something else. That was something else. And it's just how many troops were there, how many brigades, how, you know, mm-hmm. and exactly what they were looking at too, during those, those, uh, those last two days, you know, and then also what I was just thinking to myself walking through that, all those lines was, man, these are only two, this is just two core. Could you imagine if Yule's core was over there as well? They would have been probably over at either on, uh, from the first day over near McPherson's Ridge and stuff and, uh, Oak Hill, um, or maybe wrap, they would have just hooked onto Longstreet's line and wrapped around, the mountains and then gone around the mountains, you know, but Yule was of course over on Culp's Hill. So you have a whole, whole entire core over there. I mean, the armies were just absolutely gigantic and that's not even, and you know, that's nothing to Napoleonic standards, <laughs> you know, those army, right. it's just, it's mind boggling. But I think, uh, um, I would probably say devil's den 
just because I, I love uh, the 124th with uh, Colonel Van Horn Ellis and the wheat field and all that, because I know how bloody and, you know, sick, you're talking 6,000 casualties in one little field. It's little too. It's not, you know, 6,000 casualties in two hours. That's how long the battle took place in the wheat field. It was two hours long. Yeah, it's that devil's den. You go to where the soldier had been placed and staged for a photography. You get to see that. And yeah, then up at the that, very top where the cars are looping around, there's a little parking area and some cannons up that craggly old tree. And that was a witness tree up there. Yeah. And for you guys to know what a witness tree is, those were trees that, that were there present at the battle. You can you can tell by the by the girth of the trees typically. Oh, yeah. And so much of the battlefield is more open back then, but these, so there were still a lot of those a trees, lot. right? And it's like, it was creepy, man, because when we were there, there was no leaves on it, and you could really see the craggly branches, and you could see the bullet holes better. Mm-hmm. And, man, I got, I got, uh, I get it, man, right now thinking about it, I got goosebumps, right? Because I'm telling you guys, you can, you can feel it. You can feel, now, I don't know. I don't know that I necessarily believe in ghosts necessarily other than maybe there's some kind of remnant of something, but I'll tell you what, man, if I ever went back there, I would really love to do a battlefield ghost tour. Um, I didn't see anything when I was there. I was hoping to, I, I was, I will admit I was kind of con- trying to conjure up a little something respectfully, respectfully though, after I turned off the cameras, uh, on the first, first vlog on Ms. McPherson's Ridge, when we, uh, uh, when we, I stopped when we hit the iron brigade positions. I walked mm-hmm. through there late at night though. It was starting to get dark really fast, you know, mm-hmm. it was already down. Um, and so I was losing light and I did walk through there playing hell on the wall bash, the iron brigades theme song that they played co- going into the battle or marching to Gettysburg. I didn't see anything, but I was like, man, yeah. And they then on shadow people. And- yeah. We were, it was the same thing with us, man. We, the sun was going down. We were getting really hungry because we'd driven most of the day mm-hmm. to get there. And, um, and we were up there on, um, on a uh, little round top and we had parked down in that parking lot that's up from Devil's Den. So we were heading back down after we'd went up to the castle and it was getting dark. And Rob says, that's where a lot of people see shadow people down in those woods. That's where the Confederates made some of their last final attacks trying to flank that position. 15th Alabama. Yes. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Goosebumps again. I'm getting like, I'm just thinking about it because it was really surreal. Mm. And it was like what what you experienced, like in the morning, especially, like you start to see that little bit of mist coming into the forest. See, that I was going to bring that up too. Is it's not just the evening, but I was starting so early. I was starting so early, like five, five thirty, I would head out there and then I'd take a little time and then I'd turn on the camera uh, when it got a little lighter out. But there, um, that morning when I was on my way to devil's den, that was, I, that was like really early in the morning with that fog and all that. And I, there, there was nobody around. So I was like, oh, you know, hell I'll stop by the Pennsylvania monument, walk up there and walk. I mean, I felt fine the whole time. Of course there's that energy. Uh, but man, when I, that spiral staircase inside there, mm-hmm. it's the top. There, there's a light up there that's like on during the day, but I guess they close it during or they turn it off during night because when I went up there in the morning, it was pitch black uh, going up that spiral staircase. So I had to have my my phone with my flashlight on there and I felt fine going up. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. And the it was li- literally like the more I went up, the closer I get, got up to the top, the, this fear, like I started getting really fearful. and it got to the point to where like right as I was turning around the corner and I could see the light, you know, getting out of the staircase there and jumping out into like that little room before you head out to the balcony. Mm -hmm. And I, that last step, I like skipped that kind of jump skipped out of there. And I was like, Whoa, that was, I kind of, my heart was racing. I kind of had a, I didn't, I don't know why I started freaking out near the end there, but yeah, it was just going up. And the more I went up, the more fe- fearful. And then, of course, I was like, ah, now I got to go back down <laughs> after that. And then walking down was fine. It was absolutely fine. But for some reason, just right then and there, I was like, I overwhelming fear. It was really weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Another, oh. now that I'm thinking about it, another, probably one of the, the biggest aha moments, like, whoa, was, and I wasn't able, I wasn't able to get it because it was so busy. It was during the anniversary when I walked the battle lines. I think it was July 2nd when I walked the Confederate lines and there are tons of people up there on that balcony. Um, but I did go up there the night before, uh, me and, uh, me and my lady up, up there, um, it was like near the end, like the sun was going down and I got up there and that's when I was like, I really wish I was able to bring the camera up there. But I was like, wow, when I was shocked of how close Sickles position was, it was there. It was right there, just down below me right there. Yes. And I'm looking over there towards the hills and I'm like, okay, you know. And then there was the peach orchard out, out, yeah, out. Here's the front. peach orchard. You're here. It just doesn't make, I mean, I understand why he did what he did from Chancellorsville and the artillery barrage that just, they lost like 50% of their guys from being just arc battered by artillery, Confederate artillery from a, a hill position in front of them. So I understand why he didn't want that to happen anymore. Um, but, you know, you're sitting there at the peach orchard and, if anything goes wrong, which when things go wrong, not if, when Longstreet makes his assault, who's going to get there when you need help? Who's going to get there first? The guys that got a head start on you, a head start on your runner, I should say, that are not too far away from you, that are going over here, they're, they're coming this way to kill you, or your buddies in the back there that by the time they get out of these woods, they don't even know that you're in trouble until that that guy gets back there or governor K Warren sees it, which he has to send a messenger down to the core and say, Hey, the uh, sickles is in trouble. So who's going to get there first? Duh. It, you know, and uh, one thing that I didn't know that I learned over there uh, was about peach orchard is that it took long streets, men five minutes to get from the tree line to sickles position. That's how fast. And that just, yeah, that was, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> well, another thing that happened to us too, once we got to the restaurant that night was, and we got a couple of drinks in us and we had some r amazing food. Where, where oh, there's the breweries night. around there. You got it. Oh, dude, it's, it's, it's great. My I'm taking my wife next time for Apple sure. Uh, right. Cause now they do the cold wars in downtown Lancaster and we can stay at the Marriott, you know, she's all for that. Right. So, uh, but this armchair generally, we started f finding ourselves being sucked into why this and why didn't they this and the stories are just so intriguing. It's hard not to get sucked into it. Yes. And you're like, why didn't he let them flank this position? Why did he make a frontal attack on this awful position? Little round top we're talking about. And then right down, if you're on top of little round top, looking down off to the right was where sickles. And right behind Little Round Top was where the bulk of the reinforcements were coming up. So you're like, Yule, I think it was Yule, he he protested in the movie. I protest. I do this under protest. You know, General, let me flank this position. I can't. I'm going to get decimated. So we started in with that because that was obviously yeah. the first place we went. So we yeah. just focused in on that part of the battle. And over the last couple of years, I've, I've, I've thought this through and talked to some other guys that come here to play in the gaming hall and stuff, getting ready to get into ACW ourselves. And I say, I've come to the conclusion that you, you make decisions back then, like you were mentioning with sickles and stuff based on the information you had at the time. And we've back had, then, we didn't have walkie talkies years. guys. <laughs> yeah. we, we've had 158 years. Right. To study it. They did everything through runners yeah. or men on horseback passing messages and scant uh, information from scouts yep. and also taking consideration. And then this was a portrayed well in Gettysburg. The movie was Lee knew his men were they were riled up. And yet it happened that first day when they were sucked into that engagement where he said, don't engage. But they were sucked in anyway. That yeah. goes to show you the, the timber of the men, the. He said, I cannot deny these men their rightful place to attack. And, you know, he, he wanted them, he, he wanted to harness that. He thought yeah. we got to strike fast. We got to start strike hard. We can't fall back. You know, I might lose the impetus of the men's morale 
exactly. So all these factors come into play. There's literally, it's so faceted, but generally you got to, and you know, obviously after the war, Longstreet was very critical and everybody had opinions after the war. Yeah. But they, he was riled for it. I mean, he was in parts of the South. He was hated. Yeah. So uh, after the war, because of the things he was, you know, he was saying, but Killer Angels, uh, uh, it's always that Monday morning quarterback. Why didn't they call this play? You know, right. they should have thrown the bomb. When um, I was in high school, I and, and I was the quarterback. You know, right? So, yeah. Now they should have. I can't understand why they decided to punt. Uh, I heard that crap. So we're in Buckeye country, and I'm not a huge sports fan. I went to Minnesota for school, but. <laughs> Uh, I heard that crap growing up every Monday morning, you know, why didn't this and why that I kind of got tired of it. So, yeah. So I resigned myself to, Hey, they made the best decisions they could at the time based on a whole lot of factors. And a lot of it was just scant information. He really didn't know sometimes really what he was up against, especially in Pickett's charge. He had no re idea. They were a shooting over their heads with the cannons and B that they were heavily reinforced, right? Yeah. They were bringing more reinforcements up. So, yeah. uh, you Which know, I think in the first, our, our first show, uh, I also mentioned how Hancock had his artillery guys slowly hold off, you know, slowly stop firing a battery here and there to give them the impression that they, the Confederates were looking for is, Hey, okay, good. We're doing our job. We're taking a lot of their artillery out of there before we send our guys in. And then when they started coming out of those trees, a lot of them were already out of the trees for hours trying to get deployed. Those poor guys in the, in the hot sun there. Uh, there was, there was reports of guys passing out mm -hmm. waiting for the attack. Uh, and of course, by the time they started their assault, Hancock just said, okay, turn them all, turn the engines back on. Let's let them rip, you know, and just absolutely just those poor guys caught in hell. Yeah, it was, it was rough. That picket's charge was a rough place on the battlefield yeah. to see. Um, but uh, real quick, uh, we're going to, we'll, uh, we'll bounce off of this. We don't want to belabor it too much because I want to still encourage you guys get on Stug's YouTube channel, watch his video series. Um, they're not the best on there. Uh, the battle, it's raw. It's, it's, it's in person. It's not doctored up and sure. Yeah. There's no it. other person holding a camera or anything. Right. It's just, you're seeing, you're basically, you're going, you're right next to me and you're seeing what I'm seeing, discovering what I'm seeing. Cause that's my really first time. I mean, I've been there before, but that's my first time with my adult eyes understanding what's going on, you know? So, yeah. So we're going to share, uh, I'm going to put up uh, uh, History Underground uh, is another resource that is excellent. It's uh, very much like what Stu had accomplished, which is a guy with his wife and a camera. And he is really, and then this guy that runs his channel guy is a school teacher. So he uh, he has training in communications and communications and presentations. So he's yeah, really just well, gotten better and better. That's what he does too. It's, yeah, it's, it's just good. better and better. He's very, the other thing that's great too, man, is it this guy's just so down to earth, right? So it really resonates. I watch every video he puts up um, religiously. Um, his D-Day ones are awesome. Those yeah. Were, I mean, I was just, watching those morning it's just the best and he's he's just uh authentic yep. uh you know and another one i'm gonna throw up here is um you know many of you may have gone to this uh, uh youtube channel before but the american battlefield trust of course They're the best uh, the gary can get a little hyper but hey that's passion man that's passion right. but he has a lot of um help uh with producing his videos and uh, with presenters and some of the, the people that are local people from the battlefields, all the different, you know, Antietam and all the other places he does, they do th for uh, the civil war. Uh, it's a treasure. All these videos are a treasure. So if you really watch them and you really listen to them and some of them, I watch several times and you can Thank catch you. little bits and pieces that you just don't get from history books. Yep. Right, because they're local people. They've been born and raised there. Their their roots are there, and that's so powerful when you yeah, hear yeah. all the nuances of the creeks and the little ridges and the things that we just don't take into account. Which we're you know facing these generals and the guys making the decisions. Um, 
you know, they didn't know everything. They weren't from Pennsylvania, most of these guys, and they would try to find locals oh. and say, hey, what's over this ridge? What can we expect? Besides the Pennsylvanians, they knew as much as Lee and the, and, and the Southern guys up there, you know? Yep. Because it's North doesn't mean all the guys, you know, the guys from New York or anything, you know, those Irish boys from New York or Boston or Philadelphia, you know, they don't know any of that. No. You know, <laughs> know stuff, you know, so you got so many components. But I, I will put a plug in, though, for the American Battlefields Trust. Those guys are awesome. And uh, when I met them on Oak Ridge, uh, they were just the nicest guys. Absolutely just the nicest, uh, especially Gary. And I will never, ever forget. I, I was sitting there patient. Uh, they were um, – I just got done doing the, the McPherson's uh, Museum. I showed up early in the morning there and did that. And I was like, man, I, I'm hoping – I was talking to this one guy, and I was like, oh, I, I, I hope I, I see Matt Atkinson, Ranger Matt Atkinson. I love his videos and then Battlefield's Trust guys. And so when I got done, I went – I got in my car. I went on YouTube and they were live over on Oak Ridge, which was just right over there. And I was like, right. I, I was watching there. it too. I was sitting on the couch early in the morning watching it. Yep. And I sat there and I just leaned up against the tree and just kind of watched them do their thing. And, and, you know, it was really cool watching it just sitting there like, man, these, here's these guys are, these guys are like celebrities to me. I've watched them for years. And, uh, and you know how they kind of like take turns talking yes well gary got done talking and then he went off a little, and then he saw me and i was just kind of sitting there he walked across the street came on over shook my hand and said hi i'm gary and i go oh i know you gary i've been watching you guys for years and he goes well you know he goes well you know my name so what's your name <laughs> and i introduced myself and he and uh i had um i had this Right here, this book. I brought yeah. this out so that way they, hey, you know, I know. I was like, I, I've got to get one of those because you were flipping through it. And I was like, man, that's a pretty damn good book. Yeah. Well, I have a, a stack of books here for the show to show oh, you wow. what I got. And there's something that's, I hate to say it, a little bit better. Um, more production in this. It looks a lot, this is a lot nicer and fancier, but this is more in depth though. Um, and it's like that thick. Um, and it's just on Gettysburg. But, uh, no, he he's, he's an like, ambassador. He's yeah, a history he, ambassador. He, he signed. Nice. He signed it. Yeah. So that was really cool. And uh, and I was like, hey, I I know you guys are go 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 for these next three days, but uh, I would love it if I get, can get a picture with all you guys. You guys are like idols of me. And uh, so they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold, just give us a little bit, blah blah blah. And then they got done. They went off uh, off YouTube and took a picture with me and that was, uh, that was quite, quite a treat, quite a treat, which I think I, I shared it in the uh, discord, but here's uh, amazing. me and the boys. Nice. It's probably not going to focus, but oh, well you can tell who's who <laughs> Matt Atkinson. I've watched every one of his videos religiously, sometimes multiple times, you know, I go, going up to bed and I tell people, Hey, I go to bed with the chickens, man. I go to bed at eight cause I got to get up at five. Uh, with the dogs. And then I've got to, Hey man, you got to get started early if you want to beat that heat boy. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, so in the evenings when I'm upstairs, we're both scrolling on our tablets. I I'll put one of his videos on and, um, I just, the Southern, the Southerner in me just loves him because that's how we just, we love to tell stories and mess with people and, you know, joke around mm -hmm. and kid around. And I, that resonates with me because that's, you know, my yeah. relatives are much like that. So, um, that's a special trait, um, that, that, that he has, that's just, and that was the, my next point. I was like, dude, when you okay. come back like me, I was sat there and I was talking to my wife, you know, agriculture my whole life. Um, you know, I love that, but I'm like, you know what? My absolute dream job would have been was to be a battlefield guide. Yeah. Uh, and, and most people don't realize how hard it is to become a battlefield guide. Yeah. Um, that it's a real feather in your cap. Um, cause you really got to know your stuff. I ran into two guys in, in the wheat field that mm -hmm. clearly were training. And I said, you guys are getting your battlefields license. I see don't, aren't you? You know? And they go, Oh, well, both of us are, but, uh, that's about two years down the road. Right. It's just like, wow. Cause I'm sitting here listening to him and he's sitting here. No, no book. I mean, he, well, the reason that, 
that I'll just show it right now. Well, Greg on Little Wars TV, he was a battlefield guide. Yes, uh, Antietam, I think. Yep. And Gettysburg as well. This right here. This is a good book. It's fifty dollars. It's pricey, but it Ooh, is a wow. thick boy, and it nice. shows you everything what's going on, every detail, and it's got a dis description of what's going on for each page. I mean, it's yeah. This is what he had, and at the end, not only does it have the order of battle, but it also shows you the num the percentage of uh, casualties during the battle that each regiment suffered the percentage as well as the numbers of how, how much they had going into the battle and how much they had going out of the battle. Cause that's so, uh, something that piqued my interest on that cover was uh, it said the word use the word campaign because uh, that we're going to loop that back in with gaslights comment, which is oh, what is your right. favorite campaign yes, or war right, game. Right. And we talked about this on the last podcast, and that is, hey, even on a 12-foot table, a 50-foot table, you're never going to recreate that whole battle unless you had a, like they did with the Nepal, the Waterloo game in, in the UK. But that's the small battles leading up, the little skirmishes, the little um, with probes and the things like that. That's that's personally what I, I'm going to focus in on as I get into ACW and what we're doing here now um, this coming uh, the end of this month with our Napoleonics is we're going to fight this little smaller stuff, smaller scale stuff, skirmish stuff even um, because we, it's, you know, you could take maybe uh, Devil's Den, model Devil's Den, or not Devil's Den, a uh, little round top, let's say you could model that. And you could fight that battle. And that would be amazing. You especially would be some great to take to a, a, uh, a, uh, uh, what, what am I looking for here? One of the uh, shows that you can go to like cold wars, uh, is like a showcase game, Show it off. Um, but, uh, that would be my answer to gaslight is, uh, you know, obviously Gettysburg, uh, you know, any uh, Antietam, if you've not been in all these battlefields, Fredericksburg, you're just on and on and on, you know, getting down into Tennessee, there's a, the whole different theaters. So it's so deep, it's so deep. And there's lots of little battles that aren't really ever talked about. Um, that would be great to do on a, on a tabletop game, especially that epic scale. You don't need as much space. If, if you'd played that on my 12 foot table, man, you could probably pull off half of Gettysburg, probably maybe, but um, I'd like to do Shiloh. What about you? What's your favorite? Uh, would it be Gettysburg? Um, would it be your favorite battle or campaign? I want to say my heart says Gettysburg, but mm -hmm. if I wanted to kind of be different, Shiloh. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. many trees on on the table. It just it, if you're not pissed off playing because of all the trees, you ain't doing it right. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing is the, the, the terrain is a it's hard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So uh, uh, let's see. I've uh, introduced, if a lot of you guys haven't, and on the replays, especially on Twitch uh, and on uh, YouTube, if you have not checked out those two YouTube channels, definitely sub them and start watching them. If you're, <clears throat> what I'm trying to also do, do also is to reach out to some of these, uh, you know, you know gamers and stuff on Twitch and see if maybe I could pique their interest in something different an actual hobby. When you're done at the end of the day, like you see Stigmaster doing there, you have actually something to show for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So instead of a lot of video games and what you're done. I'm not a video game guy. It's I, I did it, been there, done that. Um, and I just got tired of trying to compete against guys who obviously play video games all day long. Um, and I'm a competitive person and, uh, I like to win <laughs> and, uh, like most, like most people are, I guess, but I couldn't uh, bear losing and getting beat by, you know, 12 year olds cause they play video games 14 hours a day. But, uh, and then I was like, Hey, you know, I've been war gaming. My son was interested in it when he was younger and we got into 40 K initially, like I did in college. And then it was done. I was, I, as the time went on, I, completely stopped playing video games um, and focused entirely on war gaming, mostly flames of war, as you know, anybody that works looks at my old videos, but um, so on the replay guys, if you're watching this, check it out. I mean, start, if you're a history lover, you you've loved history and you kind of, 
you're kind of in the closet a little bit because uh, everybody these days are like, oh, yeah, it's boring. You know, you take a couple of my son's friends were over here on a, a sleepover. We got up in the morning and the next day we were going to go to the Franklin Park Conservatory and the Columbus Museum of Art on a Sunday because you can get into both those places for free on Sunday. And I was raising two little kids and, you know, we had to be frugal with our money. <laughs> but um I'm like, we're going to go to Schmidt's down in German village for lunch. Then we're going to go to these two places. And those kids were out of here so freaking fast. I came down out of the shower and I'm like, where did the two boys go? And he said, oh, they left. I'm like, oh, that what's because, hey, somebody said museum. You know, this this scary word. I got to go actually go and think and and use my brain and Mm -hmm. experience things. I was made an impact on me. I was like so many young kids these days are not exposed. My kids were like, Hey, I, they were like excited to go. Hey, we're going to the museum today. Yeah. Cause that's just what, since they were little babies, we were going to museums and, um, I was like, wow, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Why would they leave? I haven't, they been to Schmitz. Haven't they had a cream puff from Schmitz? I mean, that's sacrilege, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, if you guys are watching this, you love history. I say get get into it, man, because life mm-hmm. is short. Number one, number two. At the end of the day, man, you got to have other interests in your life besides work. I yep. mean, I was a workaholic for years and years, and I realized, hey, I've got to get back into some of my old hobbies that I used to like because um, I need to it, I need to enjoy myself a little bit. So I encourage you guys to do that. And look at wargaming. You know, you can start with just something small like bolt action, which is World War II, right? Yeah. Yeah, something about small. World War II. Uh, Hirohito in the in the chat, everybody, the oh, great yes. emperor of Japan, uh, saying, saying uh, think about bombing Pearl Harbor. Uh, there is there. I've always wanted to do that uh, that game, uh, Pearl Harbor. And there's actually, there's a couple of um, STL files, like little ships. Um, yes. of course, they're a lot more cheaper than Warlord uh, Victory at Sea and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, scale ships that you can 3D print uh, yep. on, on the website somewhere. I forget the scale. It's a little hard to find, but, and they're a little pricey. But, I mean, once you have those files, you can make as many as, as you possibly can. And he... They have every class of every ship of every type and plane during World War II for Germany, U.S., Japan, Britain, France, even U.K. I don't know if I already said the U.K. Um, anyway, uh, if you can find it on there, it's really cool. And I've always wanted to get those STL files and when I get a printer and uh, – print those out and make a scaled model board of, of Pearl Harbor and have the ships exactly where they were supposed to be. And, you know, you have so many waves or whatever, those planes, and you just start go ahead and, and going for it. And I think you could play it by yourself early, you know? Well, yeah. And then there's, you can just do a homespun game too. So, yes. and you yeah. can make stuff out of just scratch build out of uh, balsa wood. You can make, ships if you needed to, um, yeah. you know, for guys out there who could be younger guys, 15, 14, uh, the, the, the depth of this hobby to this day even amazes me how deep it is. And I, I, I have to set limits, you know, I can't play everything that I want to play. Right. I have to say, I'm going to try to come up with eight games that I just are really like my core games because you can get in deep guys with this, uh, with this hobby with the modeling aspect, uh, now we're getting really into the 3D printing aspect of it. So it's so deep uh, what Stug is doing there with the painting. And what I told uh, young guys. This is, deep. Like, this is maybe too deep. Yeah, that's deep. When I mean, paying, that's deep. When you're painting Irish Brigade and you're wearing Irish. <laughs> and those are small, dude. And so yeah. that's dedication. But I tell guys, it's like when you first get started, you know, you get married or whatever. Um, not necessarily have to be married, I guess, but, um, Hey, the wife's car needs something done to it and I can't afford, well, I could, but I want to save the money. I want to fix the brakes myself. So what you do, you buy the tools you need to get the job done. And then the next time something else needs fixed, you buy the tools to get the job done. It's just like that with this hobby guys. Don't be intimidated. Uh, you know, watch my videos. Oh, this guy's got this big room and all these paints and, all this stuff. Well, guys, I started on a card table. Okay. 
you don't, you know, you start like most things in life, you start small, buy what you need when you need it, uh, make do with what you have. And, you know, as you progress along and you say, Hey, I, I need this or I needed that. And the next thing you know, you're, you know, 40, 50 years old and you got a shit ton of stuff <laughs> that you've collected, but that's kind of how it is. Don't, uh, don't get intimidated. Um, and, uh, the, the, the aspect we're talking about today, guys, with, uh, Stug is, is just the love of the history mm-hmm. and converting that to the war gaming aspect, because it really gives that, uh, when you do sit down and play and you've been looking into the history aspect of it, like I have been with the Napoleonics recently, this last couple of weeks is I'm just excited to play now on the 31st, you know, I'm like, Oh, you know, I got to get these guys done. And I, it gives me more fuel to, to get these line troops painted, you know, Oh, it's easy to get bogged down. So I painted these like three years ago. I bought the starter box, but the other aspect guys is like I said, with 3d printing, Philip, uh, my buddy that's coming to play, uh, He's a CNC machinist, but he shot me this on my email. It's a file for the little movement trays because we decided for this game, our standard units were going to be 160 millimeter frontage. So you start getting into all these other aspects of the game, guys, like the basing, you know, how am I going to base it? There's all kinds of little cool little things once you get in this hobby and it adds a lot of fluff and a lot of flavor to your life because I, we spent most of the day working out how we were going to do our basing what size our units were going to be. And, uh, I haven't watched a bit of TV. I haven't wasted any time today, you know, sitting on the couch, watching some ridiculous show. I've watched 50 times. I feel like we've really had a productive day. You know, we actually really got something done today. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we got Hirohito made another comment. Konnichiwa. Konodistemas. Uh, we have, I'm currently only building Tamiya models cause I don't have anyone to play Warhammer, et cetera. Oh yeah. That is an issue. That's a good point. You brought up there. Hirohito is, um, even with my gaming hall, I mean, everyone's so busy. Um, I really throw date, a date out there and anymore. I put a date, uh, once a month, I get a different game going on over here as a group game. And, uh, I'm at the point now I, I, I'm like, here's the date, here's the time. You can either make it or you can't. If I get one person, that's fine. If I get four people, that's fine. Because it's so hard these days um, to find a group of guys to play with locally that are dedicated and will play even once every three months. Because, hey, some guys have little kids. Some guys are, you know, working odd hours. Some guys... um, just you can't always make it every month and you just have to accept that if you could find one solid person to play with and i would say hirohito uh, get online type in gaming club in your area type in your area Some, sometimes you may have to drive 50 miles to get a steady game yeah like a me. gaming store a comic book shop you never know where you'll find a game and you know don't give up if, if you just keep reaching out the way that has been magical for me with this YouTube channel is out the, uh, every guy I have here, like Philip, for example, I met through YouTube, right? He lives on the West side of Ohio. He drives an hour and a half one way to come game here at my gaming hall. I got another guy. He lives an hour away. I've got guys that live three hours away that drive here to play. Um, and I've got guys that live half hour away. That and they probably drive that far because they're in the same boat as well. Correct. And it's once a month and they don't have to come to every game. They come to maybe one every, once every three games. They take, they tell their wife, Hey, I'm not going to be here this day. I'm driving to Delaware, Ohio. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I wanted to make sure when we had the gaming hall finished, we had the ability to feed everyone. Right. So when they come here, they don't have to worry about being hungry. Um, we have plenty of places to park here. Um, so, yeah, look for something like that. Start something like that. You can, if you have a, a, a larger room in your house or even a kitchen where you got a kitchen table and you find someone online that uh, is willing to come, don't be afraid. You know, you get hit by the fear factor like Stu did when he went up those dark stairs. Don't cave into the fear, guys. Uh, you got to, don't give in to it because the 99.9% of the people, because you think, oh, these are people I don't really know that well. You know, they're going to come to my house. They're probably going to shoot me. <laughs> no, 
Uh, you think that sometimes when you sell stuff on Craigslist and they come and they come with cash and you're going to sell them something that you have to sell. Oh, should I you look guys, most people that's so remote that that would happen. Plus I'd be packing a gun too, you know? So if they started any shit, they wouldn't want to do that. But, um, <laughs> but don't just, my point is don't cave into the fear guys. Most people are, are cool. And, um, uh, you know, I got to snooze this, this trying to do a uh, update on my damn computer in the middle of the podcast here. But, uh, yeah, uh, he's com commenting here. We have a Warhammer shop an hour away. Well, hey, man, just, you know, once a month, trek over there, but time it when they're doing some time of a game. Uh, maybe yep. I think they do a lot of demo games in those shops. And uh, you meet somebody and uh, even like at a game store um, that you click with and you're interested in the same era, say World War II. Um, next thing you know, hey, come to my place and play. You know, we'll order a pizza, that kind the of thing. Two is usually the, the get go for people, you know. Here's what's happening, guys. It's just something that just popped into my head here. Um, what's happening really in the last year and a half, especially, too, is they've divided us up, guys. People are f literally afraid of other people. Right. And that's bad. You know, we are having games the whole time here. As soon as my uh, gaming hall was done, we were still going to my buddy Rob's house playing. Uh, once a month, we were still going down to a local game shop before they shut it down. Um, cause I'm not going to cave into the pier guys and guess what? Nobody got sick. Everyone's fine. We broke bread. We had good food. Um, we have some amazing memories. Um, the, the other thing too, guys, that I've noticed with my games here and I, you know, want to point this out is, um, well, it's not just war gaming. We were talking about life, kids traffic, you know, all kinds of things before the game would start after the game, when we stopped to eat, um, that's guys, that's like gold because that's, that's your camaraderie. Like the soldiers had, you know, that were fighting together. That's why they went there every year after Gettysburg as reunions to meet up with their buddies. And that's the kind of relationship you can have through war gaming. You know, you can get that somewhat with video games when you're on your chat. But it's not the same. It's just not the same. When you shake hands, you're right across the table from another guy. You're both wanting to win. Uh, it's, it's it's a special nugget with this hobby that that can't be replaced. So I'm encouraging everybody to do what you can. Reach out. Get online. Use the tools we have. The modern tools, as in as uh, inefficient sometimes as they are, uh, don't be afraid to reach out and hook up with other other dudes or gals to play. Um, but for me, it's been YouTube. It just opened this whole door, um, with other gamers out there. That's how I met Rob. Everybody was just like, Hey, where do you live again? Delaware, Ohio. Well, shit. I just live over in Granville. <laughs> and it turns out he was an avid cyclist. I'm an avid cyclist. Um, you, you find, here's the thing I've noticed in life being 56 years old is this like attracts like it's this weird thing. And you can be walking around on a battlefield and you start chatting with somebody who's standing there looking at the view as you're looking at. And next thing you know, hey, I'm from there, too. And I have this in common with you. And it's just bizarre. It's almost like celestial bodies being attracted to each other. That's um, the, that's one thing that always occurred walking around because really wild. And, and it's just like it's so different because I'm not used to that at home. You know, it's not like right. the war battlefields over in Washington State. Uh and it's like, you know, here's this guy. We As soon as you lock eyes, you're instantly talking. You know, you guys are buddies. Like, like, And plus, over there, people are so nice over there. It really shocked me uh, instead of home, you know, what it's like at home. But uh, so that's one thing. But um, you lock eyes, though, and it's just like instantly start talking, and you're just passionate about the same thing. Because, I mean, it's not like – you guys don't have anything in common. You, you both are sitting there in the wheat field in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. You got stuff. Age doesn't it. matter. Age exactly. doesn't matter. Exactly. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I tons of guys I, I met over there and just, just nice. But again, 
it's, they're there the same reason you're there. It's not like you guys are walking down the street at some town or something like that. You guys are on, on Gettysburg Battlefield. You guys want are there because you want to see the battlefield. So it's just instantly conversation, best friends, you know. So, yeah. Right. Well, Hirohito, you know, he's he doesn't like to ride the trains and listen that. And, uh, yeah, for every for every reason you come up with how you can't do something, I would love to hear a reason how you can do it. Uh, because you can do it and you here's the other thing i learned uh hirohito in life uh in my ripe old age of 56 is this focus on the good people ignore the crap people you're yeah. gonna run into crappy people every day more than likely and you're gonna run into good people and focus on those people ignore the the trolls and the he said ghosted he used the term ghosted where that you make you make an appointment to meet someone to play something or to do something and they don't show up and it, it's easy to say oh you know everybody's like this well no everybody isn't like that i found that out with the guys that i game with can they come to every game no uh would i like to have six guys down here every single month to play well yeah sure because it's just more dudes to 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 uh to basically have fun with but um, hey, I'm happy if one person comes and plays and we have fun and have a good conversation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's been guys that just disappear, you know, that have come here to play and then they, you don't see them again. Uh, that's been that way on YouTube. It's been that way on a lot of things. Uh, and boy scouts, uh, taking my son all the way to Eagle scout was, uh, you know, flaky parents, flaky scouts. And it's easy to say, Oh, this is ridiculous. I'm going to quit. I'm not doing this anymore. Well, guess what? For every bad person, there was one or two good people that were there to help and we had good time. So you just can't let the bad people drag you down, guys. I forget the song, but, you know, keep your head up. Keep moving forward. Uh, that's oh, your head up. Well, Don't tell me how you can't do it. Tell me how you can. And, uh, you know, get at it um, and just be persistent. Yeah. If you can just, like I said, if you can find one person to play with on a fairly regular basis, you're doing good. Uh, and yeah, I can imagine being a young person these days trying to find a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Oh, my Lord. Um, but and that's uh, where the depth of character comes in, guys. You show your character. If you say, hey, I'm going to be I'll meet you at the comic shop at four o'clock. Freaking meet them there at four o'clock, guys, or whatever. Um you know, be a, a man of your word, a woman of your word. That's important too. And then they won't think you're a flake, right? Cause it works both ways. You know, you both have to look, a relationship is a two way street. Everybody's got to give a little, right? Now, do I always get my way with my wife? Hell no. Does she always get her way with me? No, but we meet somewhere in the middle sometimes. Um, but, uh, I'm getting off the beaten track here, but you get the point. Uh, <laughs> Ellen, uh, reach out, try me. to find somebody, uh, you know, start, if start a YouTube channel or whatever, get, uh, get over on my discord group guys. There's guys in there. Maybe my, one of those might live near you. You never know. Yeah. Uh, Alan, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. share my screen and, uh, show a couple of pictures I took during Absolutely. the trip and kind of get on the civil war thing again. Um, yep, 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 yep. I can do it. Screen share. Uh, let's see right. there. Is there a share screen we can do? Let's see. What are you sharing? Are you sharing, uh, from discord? Maybe. Don't Maybe I'm just kind of doing off of the, the thing here. I can bring up my discord. You got pictures on discord. How's that? Wait, hold on. How's that? Ooh. Okay. Okay. So That's we're infinity. Yeah, right. There. How's that? A little bit better. We just have a blank. Um yeah, it's showing infinity. It's showing you your basically OBS looks like. Oh. No, it's not coming through. Oh, well. um, if you have a host of pictures on discord, I can pull that up easily. Yeah. I so you would be on, um, either my group or I could actually go I'll to, send, I'll just send stuff to you. Yeah. You can just uh, pull it up there. I'll pull up uh discord right now 
guys, bear with us. I'm going to do what's called a share screen. It's on my uh, stream yard is one of the um, options we have. Um, so yeah, guys, don't uh, get on Discord because it's far superior to Facebook because they're not data mining the crap out of you, number one. Number two, uh, this is a much more efficient way for gamers, you know, tabletop war gamers to communicate with each other, share pictures, uh, chat with each other. Yeah, see, here we go. So I can click on these. Uh, get on over, back over. We can click on this sucker. Hopefully it's not blurry. It's looking a little blurry for some reason. This isn't really going too well. <laughs> so you got but your just, in front of a battle flag, it looks like. Yeah, and a grandma in the corner. Oh, so uh, but uh, I took that photo to get a scale because I'm six foot one. So that just kind of gives you a scale of the size of these right. flags, you know, and how grand they are. Um, yeah. And then we'll pull up the next photo. And the battle is quiet now. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's the core, uh, the first core flag, of course. Um, which I also, this is a great picture. I love this picture. This monument, of course, you, you've already, you've seen the videos, but for the people that haven't, though, this memorial is absolutely breathtaking. Oh, wow. Back. I did not see that. That's really intricate. Yes. And it's uh, it's the 69th Irish, the six, 63rd, and the 88th yeah. Irish. Um, but there was also, it wasn't just those three in the brigade. Uh, there was also the 28th Massachusetts, as well as the 116th Pennsylvania, maybe. Maybe. Uh, what's at the base of the statue there? That is the sleeping dog. Okay. Yeah. Um, And then what, speak about the American Battlefields Trust. This is the one. It's me and the board. Me I and the board. Enlarge these photos. That's one of the downsides. And as these uh, platforms develop, they'll they'll get it so we can we can enlarge this photo. But um, that's really cool. Um, that is a picture of Meade's hat. Get Meade's and then. Right there. Oh, Meade. Wow. yeah. And Another then the one, underrated general. Yes, very. And then the one on the bottom, that is the Declaration of Independence from South Carolina, the first state to succeed. To succeed. Or succeed. 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 Succeed from the union. See ya, we're out of here. Yeah. Uh, here's another beautiful uh, flag. 139th Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, I like that. That's uh, the horses is amazing. And then um, here's a really I can find it. Here's a really cool one. Uh, during the Battle of the Wheat Field, um, I believe I think these are all, if I remember cor correctly, these are all division or brigade commanders of the Second Corps. Um, you got Kelly Brook Zook. And someone else, but Zook though is a badass. I love Zook, um, and this is his uh, post-war flag, um, General Zook's regimental flag, oh, with nice. some uniforms in front of it. Which Zook is awesome. Uh, if you watch the American Battlefields Trust, um, their anniversary videos that they did during during the 158th anniversary. The Wheelfield one is awesome. Uh, and they actually tell a story of Zook, uh, who was a, a very renowned cusser during those days. He had a body mouth. And, of course, so did Hancock, the Second Corps uh, commander, um, which Hancock is, is one of my favorites of all time. Love Hancock. Uh, and him... Another underrated general... Yes, yes, very. And runs for the President of the United States. Um, he and Zook, there is a story that they tell during that video, and it's him and Zook just having it out, just just ripping into each other as their troops are going by on the march, just giving it to each other, saying, cussing at each other, giving all these insults. 
uh, it's pretty entertaining that video. I highly recommend it. But those are uh, just some. I don't think there's any other ones that I want. Uh, I wanted to really share that are kind of significant in some ways. I have some pictures of some uh, some uniforms and stuff like that. Uh, but most of the stuff, though, you can see while I'm discovering it on uh, uh, right there during those videos that I I posted. So I think that's all sorta. Um, Here's me, kind of a goofy face on, on myself, but uh, me at the Bloody Lane in the uh, Battle of Antietam. How large is that one? There it is. The Bloody Lane. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I've been there. It was whew, the tower. Yeah. Another great, another great building to go in because when you go to that upper floor and look out over the battlefield from inside that building is amazing. Oh yeah, amazing. The, uh, cash oh, town. Yeah, yeah. Cash town in. Yep, yep. Had to go there, and then a, a nice picture of little round top from. Uh, um, yeah. Right, and you sit down there. We, we were down there getting ready to go up that little road there. Yep. And I'm like, no, that's like. That you need double the men to take that because of and they had a bat battery up there shooting down at you too right like, with the parrot guns and they're just gonna rape you i don't know man i don't know what he was thinking i don't even think i don't know that lee had ever been to that ground and really seen what what was up there i don't think yeah um i don't know that was a that was a tough one for me to get past when we got back into town i was like man i can't believe uh i don't know man I don't know about that. He wanted to silence those guns, I know, but I don't know. We're not going to arm it. I'm not going to arm it. quarterback it, but yeah, that no. was a toughie, man. That was a toughie. They did it, though. And you got to, you know, even if. Now, if you would just take that hill, General, and push those people off of it. Yeah. I love how he was talking. <laughs> he was just saying, Put, get those people, push those people away. Yeah. And, uh, who are those people over there? Yeah. Yep. That's what he said. <laughs> we always preferred, uh, when talking about the enemy, you always said, uh, those, those people, those people get those uh, people off that hill. If you would please general, um, I'm a, as you can probably tell, I'm a big fan of the Irish brigade and all that stuff. Uh, there's one more picture of, uh, one of the Irish monuments at, uh, um, during Pick's charge. That's about it. That's all I wanted to wanted to share. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting question for you, Stu. You can answer this one. You, I'll let you answer this one, and then I'll answer it. How is it to live in the U.S. though, or just in your state? I have never had the chance. Uh, Hirohito, are you from Japan? Is that where you're from? Seriously, Konnichiwa. Um. Yeah. What's your take on that one? Well, all states are different. That's why we had the Civil War. You know, <laughs> is they can uh, they have their own rules and everything like that, other than the country's rules. Um, so a lot of things are different in each state, uh, the lifestyles, and of course, you know, it's it's a very big land. Germany, gotcha. Um, yeah, actually, it's kind of like Germany a little bit during the 1800s. You know, when uh, before um, the revolutions and before everything kind of went into one big country. You know, you had all these other spots and it's still today is kind of you know bavaria and stuff like mm -hmm. that um it's kind of like that you know there's everybody's the same but they're different at the same time you know different lifestyles different same language same uh um you know same land all that stuff it's just i i guess that's how i kind of put it you know it's, it's kind of like germany back back in those days you know correct um, the, the different cultures and people don't realize bavaria fought with napoleon exactly um, yeah and until the very end then they they understood what side the wind was blowing right <laughs> so yeah it's it's just similar to deutschland uh i mean you're gonna have the different flavors i say over here the biggest problem yeah. we're probably having in all the western world right now is the the people are just too divided i mean uh i think it's by design unfortunately but I think people need to come together and we need to start focusing on our similarities instead of our differences. But 
Um, Speaking about you know, the Germans, though, the eleventh corps were at Gettysburg. You got Schultz, Steinwehr, and uh, um, yeah, Barlow, which Barlow was not a German, but he was in charge of the Germans uh, right before Chancellorsville, and he was he hated Germans, absolutely hated them. Uh, some of the things he wrote down uh, back to his mother about the Germans were absolutely just got awful. Uh, but the Germans were there; they were fighting. Oh yeah. Yeah, several br uh, cool. brigades and, and regiments were yeah, pretty too. much all German. Yeah, yeah, most of them were. Um, but yeah, look up Siegel though. Siegel's one of my favorites. He doesn't make it to the Battle of Gettysburg. He basically kind of there was like a little bit of a bluff. He was like, "Well, if if I'm not uh, you want me to do this, well, I'm not going to do it, and I'm just going to resign, and then you're not going to have me anymore in command." And basically, they're like, "Okay, sounds good." And then he was like, "Oh." my bluff did not work. And then he got a desk job. Um, but Siegel though was awesome. Not the prettiest looking face, but he's, uh, quite the, uh, quite the character though. If you're wanting some German history, Hey, gun barrel. Yeah. My buddy, uh, up, uh, man, me and, me and him go way back. Yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, you know, being from, uh, more of the South originally, and then moving North for my father's schooling. Um, you know, you definitely have the cultural differences or, you know, I didn't, I saw that as a kid, you know, yeah. as you go further South, it seems like people get nicer. It seems. <laughs> yeah. I noticed uh, that on the trip. It was kind of a, a, a ha aha moment, especially like country people or city people, you know, yeah. you're right on top of other people and you're constantly fighting over stuff like traffic, et cetera, food. Don't go to uh, Washington State. We're assholes over here. I mean, we're out here in the country, man. We're just chill. We sit on the front porch in the morning and sip coffee and listen Lemonade. to chirp and Lemonade. Our big look, our biggest problem every day here where I live is what are we going to have for dinner tonight? You know? So uh, that's a big problem. You know, we'd have to, well, should we have steak? Should we have meatloaf? Should we have chicken? You know, that's the big topic of cons uh, con uh, conversation out here in the countryside. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, everybody just needs to come together folks and, uh, whether you're left, right, center, I don't care. Uh, war gaming can cut through all of that. Um, shake hands, have a good game. Uh, so he's over there in Germany. I thought they had like, they had some good, co uh, conferences and stuff over there that he could probably go to. That was one every year in Hamburg. I'm sure it's been delayed, but. I, I think most of that stuff's coming back now. Um, I forget the name of it. German, uh, again, uh, German Civil War history, a lot of those guys, a lot of those commanders and everything, the reason why they ended up becoming commanders of German, not, be, not only because they were German, they were born in Germany, uh, and commanding German immigrants uh, that came in, same as the Irish and, and what have, um, they the reason why they became commanders was because they actually had military experience prior to coming to the U.S. because they fought in uh, um, a lot of those German revolutions uh, during the 1800s. During the uh, I think it was 1848, uh, they had the German Revolution over there and stuff that didn't go all the way through, and so they started going after these guys and wanted to cut off a lot of their heads, and so they migrated to America to escape that. And then next thing you know. It, they find themselves fighting for their new country in the American Civil War. Uh, but no, I like the Germans. I like the Germans a lot. The Germans and the Irish. Yes. I like I them. Pretty, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, German, a lot of German background on my side and uh, English. And then uh, we found out recently we had a lot of Scottish. My son had a DNA test done. Um, and I, I was shocked by that because it was it came back 60% Scottish. I was like, wow, that high. Um but yeah, I mean, I got to talking to some relatives here recently and yeah, I mean, uh, we started putting two and two together and that's where that rebel comes from. You had a lot of Scottish and Irish down in the South New Orleans, Louisiana, yeah, man, you had those frigging people. They don't want to be told what to do. Yeah. Um, now Hirohito is making a comment, you know, here's the stereotypes and I'm sure it's per uh, perpetrated by the media out there <laughs> of the world of people from the Southern Ohio, Southern USA are KKK and the people on the West coast are all gay. I think that's the comment he made. Yeah, dude, that's just the stereotypes. I mean, I deal with all walks of life. Uh, well, mostly well-to-do people in my line of work, but 
you know, it's such nonsense. I deal with Indian people, Chinese people. I'm actually getting more Chinese people um, as customers. Uh, I have gay customers. I have uh, I have customers in transition, you know, transitioning, uh, if you know what that means. And then I could care less as long as their check cashes the bank. And I talk to all these people and I have no problems, right? So it's all a bunch of stoked up BS as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's like we were talking about being out on the battlefield. I don't care if you're black, Chinese, Asian or whatever, you know, there's all kinds of walks of life there, guys. Um, you'll see when they're busy and any other place you go that's a historical site in your travels, uh, there is no divides, right? It's people that are just interested in history. And, uh, you know, there's going to be good people in the North. There's going to be bad people. And likewise in the South, I, you know, most, well, and I don't know how much it is like this as much as people move around, you know, the country's not all isolated anymore. You know, you got Northerners retiring into Florida and people from Florida move up to Michigan because it's cooler up there, whatever. Everyone's getting mushed around. So, but as a general, uh, I, I don't like to be into generalities, but you'll find most people that live out in the country tend to be more easygoing because we just don't have all the rush, 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 rush. You know, we're like, Hey, you know, I'm going to do this today. That's my goal. And I don't have to do 50 things today. Right. So you tend to be a little bit more laid back. It's also probably the way I was raised. But, um, I notice when I go to visit my son now, he lives and works in downtown Cleveland and, uh, Whew. man, those people drive like maniacs up there and everyone's rush, 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 and got to get this done and go, go do this. And I'm like, whoa, whoa slow down. But, uh, and they're like, you, where in the South are you from? When I went to university of Minnesota, the first thing someone said to me at a party was you sound like you're from the South. I'm like, well, actually I I'm from Ohio, but I was originally from the South. I thought that was weird, but yeah, we got to get away from all these stereotypes, dude, and people putting everyone in boxes and categories, which is another reason why Stu encouraged me to get off Facebook. I'm like, I'm not going to be pigeonholed. You know, I'm not this and that and the other. I'm a complex person and everyone's pretty complex. And, yeah. you know, I, I could be libertarian on one thing. Another thing, I might be conservative. And on another issue, I might be totally liberal. <laughs> you know, like I said, I don't care who you sleep with at the end of the day. It's none of my business. Um, right. Like I said, as long as your check cashes the bank, clears the bank, that's all I really care about. I got um, some good, uh, books, um, speaking about foreigners. Uh, this is a really good one. I picked up, uh, Irish at Gettysburg. Nice. Uh, it kind of gives you the impression that they're going to talk about, of course, the Irish brigade. Right. Um, but actually, uh, it goes a lot more in depth on the Irish on the Confederate side that were fighting there. And we're talking about the ones in, I think, uh, Hood's uh, Brigade uh, or Hood's Division. Um, and a lot of them that were just are not talked about because they're overseen by the Irish Brigade of the Union um, with Patrick Kelly's Brigade, uh, which used to be uh, Mar, uh, Thomas Francis Mar's uh, Brigade uh, during like Antietam and stuff. Um, but this is a really good one though, because it talks about like the, the, those Irish from D New Orleans, Louisiana down there in the bayou, those really rough guys that end oh, up, yeah. in, uh, Lee's, um, Louisiana Travel and hard Tigers. drinking baby. Yeah. The Louisiana tigers and everything. Those, those hardcore Irish suaves talks about that. This is a really good one to get. It's not too much, uh, thick reading. It's, it's pretty good. And let's uh, not forget guys back in the, in that era, they were really seen as third class citizens. So they I don't were, hear about this they racial were, nonsense. I would say they were parallel to African Americans. Well, during yeah, I mean they they were brought over here to do the factory jobs, the mining mining jobs, especially the Scottish. Yeah. Uh, you know, being um, my grandfather coming out of Appalachia in eastern Kentucky, I heard those stories, man, and those yeah. guys were hard ass workers, but yeah. Yeah. they were looked down on. They, you know, they were third class citizens big time. And that's mostly because of how many they were in such a short period of time that flooded into America because of the great, you got the great famine going on as well as England really cracking down on the Irish. You know, if you found, you're found playing a harp, you get killed, uh, you know, 
stuff right. like that. And then you got the famine at, at the same time, which you, you know, you, England ain't helping you out on that one, sending you provisions. Uh, in 1861, almost 25% of New York's population was Irish. So that just tells you how many immigrants were there uh, during that time. This is a really good one as well. This is a lot more easier of a read. Uh, this is a really, really good one. And it kind of shows uh, um, the history of the Irish Brigade and a lot of good uh, paintings by Don Triani, which I absolutely love. And also, uh, here's, yeah, here's an excellent one right here. Awesome. Um, no, some of them didn't even speak English. They spoke Gaelic. Gaelic. Yep. Yep. Well, yeah, that's all, speaking that's Gaelic, in the, which is a form of Celtic. And, yep. and, and that's all in here. Ancient language, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, that's how uh, it talks about the flags, too, in this one, which is awesome. I love learning about the flags. Uh, so that's a really good one. And, of course, speaking about Don Triani, I got this, like, little, it was five bucks. Nice. Beautiful painting of a Zouab. Yeah, that'll look great in a frame. Yes, and I got some big prints that I got over there that are on on their way in in the in in the the USPS right. So, I yeah, I mean it's a lot of information out there, guys. This is really just tipping your toe at some of the things we've touched on in this yeah. podcast. Is just this 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 hobby is just uh, so rich. Uh, you know, I have a couple other hobbies that I I engage in, of course, but this one is my favorite because. There's so much to it, um, and the creativity part is really nice. Where you have a creative outlet for um, your your artistic abilities, or your you know coming up with things for games like scenarios or like making terrain. Don't forget about that aspect is not just the model building and painting, but also the ter making terrain and coming up with cool scenarios. Last game we did World War II, of course, North Africa, and we did I did the little e Egyptian flavor. That just came to me. I don't know if I woke up in the morning and I'm like, hey, I'll make a bunch of friggin' Egyptian monuments and stuff. And those would be our uh, objectives just to make it fun. So, yeah. It, so you get these ideas and you have these uh, things that you think about doing to have a game and to make it more interesting, um, which is another creative outlet uh, for you. Uh, I don't know. Here he does being serious on this one. He says uh, he wants to move to Texas and have a cow farm. Uh, you mean cattle? That would be steers. Those are boy cows. And, yeah, gotta say it correctly. And you, yeah. better, you better like that beef. But right now, that industry is kind of going through a little bit of turmoil. But yeah, so are the chicken leg, the poor chicken leg. Yeah. They don't want us eating meat anymore, guys. Yeah, only soy burgers. <laughs> only soy in the green, right? I'll share this book I had here on the on the table and that's uh boy i was blown away i thought well this is just gonna be one of those little bitty supplement books a glory hallelujah which actually was getting kind of hard to find because with uh the the coof um you know the supply chain's been broken up and a lot of the stuff's getting printed in china uh and it's having trouble getting through the borders but look how thick this book was man this is this is an amazing book i it's got so much history in it yeah I've been man, really really it. That book. And here's the other thing with you black powder guys that out there may play back black powder is I'm noticing in this book and in my uh, Albion triumphant, which is also Gaelic. Does anyone know what Albion is nope. in the comments? What is Albion? I just found out yesterday myself. So I'm not, I'm not any kind of genius, but uh, they're, they're bringing in the costs they're bring in the point system. That was a big point of contention early on in volume one or version one of black powder is having a point system so we could possibly expand this into tournaments or also just making sure your forces are relatively equal you know not one guy's showing up with twice as much stuff as you and you're just going to get beat but uh albion was a uh, they believe is a gaelic an ancient word meaning the white cliffs of dover the white shores when uh uh, you know, the first people were coming over there, the Nordics, Nordic tribes, Celtic tribes. Uh, so the Albion is just basically another word for Britain. Um, so it's an ancient word for Britain. It's the oldest known word they know that they use to refer to the island of Britain. Of course, uh, uh, the Romans referred to them as Britons. Um, Britonians. Uh, Britonians, they were, that's Latin. But Albion, from what I read, um, and 
We're going to have Adrian Mc, McWalter is going to be on the show at some point here as soon as he gets free. Um, we've been planning that now for a couple months. He's very busy. He's a constable over there in the UK. They're really busy putting down those riots. So uh, I, I can't wait to have him on the show. I've been in contact with him now for a few years about various things. But um, I'm going to that's one of my first questions, because I'm sure he picked that the title Albion Triumphant. Uh, I got the volume two the other day. So we're building our lists for Napoleonics uh, out of that. And that, that's the, the last thing I'll, I'm going to leave everybody with. And we're going to get going because my wife, I'm sure, is working on dinner up there. Um, but uh, and I told you that's our big, whew, that's the big uh, dilemma we have here in the quiet countryside. What's well, for dinner? Uh, you know, life is rough. But uh, first world problem. But uh, um, I'm, I'm going to spin this off, this black powder basing system we are starting to come up with, which it's stated in the book and kind of gives you a range of basing. We wanted to, since because we're both still fleshing out our uh, Napoleonic army, so we kind of cut down the standard unit size to this 160 millimeter. You're supposed to be between 200 and like 260, I think. And we're talking about frontage measurement here, guys. This this uh, stand right here is 160 millimeters. Um, and Philip, being a CNC machinist, he did the file so that they literally fit in this movement tray. And you see they do not come out. They literally fit like a glove. Um, so I'm going to spin this off to my ACW unit builds because here's what we've come down to. So your basic unit size in black powder is going to be this four millimeter, I'm sorry, 40 millimeter by 40 millimeter with about four dudes on it, four soldiers. And you really don't want to go any bigger than that as far as, because everyone that watches my channel knows I love multi-basing. And I was going to multi-base my new French that I got. And he talked me out of it. He said, Al, you're going to need to form squares. You may need to go to a tournament and you may need to use those in marching order or column order. You're really going to box yourself in going with uh, just building them as line troops, you know, maybe 20 dudes on a 200 millimeter stand. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to just build um, on our 3D printers. We're just going to build different size movement trays like this where they literally just click in. That way we have the flexibility of doing whatever you want. And you're not locked into that multi-base. So there are times when multi-base works good. And there's times when multi-base doesn't work good. I think it really comes down to the rule set you're using. And then black powder, they you, there may be instances where I do need to march my troops on the other side of the battlefield and then deploy them into line, right? Just like they did a, when they actually fought back then. So anyway, so that's, that's basically what I'm going to leave everybody with. And that is you can have one game that is helping you as you get into another game. In this case, I'm going into American Civil War black powder and I'm going to be using really the same basing because that was still Napoleonic tactics, right? So, um, oh, here we go. Well, wait, one more question, Hirohito. He's going to get the award for the most active on the podcast by far. Hey, let's hear for Hirohito. Yay. For being on the podcast, sir, and uh, uh, Ich liebe Deutschland, right? Um, ich fahre Krieger, meines Großvater. All I know is Ich liebe dich. <laughs> ich liebe dich. Um, yes, my grandfather was a Krieger, Krieger, and we traced his back to a um, one of them guys who fought in the American Civil War with the British. Dang it, Hussians. His one of his relatives was a Hessian soldier that never went back. <laughs> so once the British lost, he kind of melded into the. He must have ended up in a, in the mining community in eastern Kentucky or something, up in the hills, and uh, he didn't want to go back. Anyway, so uh, his name was uh, Krieger, and uh, um, but yeah, airbrush. Uh, so definitely Iwata, hands down. I have an Iwata Neo that I really love. Uh, watch some of my videos, Hiroto. I put up some recent ones on uh, properly cleaning the airbrush. It's extremely important. Uh, you also want to purchase a air compressor that has a tank because your air com your compressor motor won't work as hard because it'll fill up that tank and you'll feed off of that tank and it'll only have to kick on every so often to 
keep regenerating the, the uh, pressure in that tank. Uh, so that's one thing I've learned in the last few years, airbrushing. And then the other thing that is a necessity is the Zenny, Z-E-N-Y, airbrush booth that folds up. You can take it different places if you need to. Uh, mine is sitting on just a, an art an art table that I bought off of Amazon. And uh, that's my permanent airbrush area. Uh, that's where I keep all my solutions and my primers. Um, I find, uh, Hirohito that, um, my airbrush is primarily used for base coating and top coating. Um, if I'm doing a model, like you said, the Tamiya models, I've done several of those as dioramas. It's really good for obviously doing, uh, base coats for those for like tanks. And then you can do your, a really good job on your camo shading your brush, and shading. Yeah. Shading. So you, I'm, I'm delving into other things. My new space Marines that I'm, that I've built, I, I actually did some of the top down shading effects on those. Uh, and I actually use those to put my base coat and my color, my, my main primer or my main color coat. Right. And did some shading on them too. So I'm, I'm, as I go along, I'm starting to experiment with new techniques also. So I'm certainly no expert, but, um, so yeah, tem, uh, a Iwata airbrush for sure. Uh, you can find a multitude of inexpensive air compressors with tanks on Amazon or any other online store. And then that Zenny airbrush booth, cause you, you don't want to breathe in those, uh, tiny particles of plastic, which is what acrylic paint is. And, uh, those filters, you don't, I change my filters. I got a bundle of filters. I probably change that like once every six months. So that's not a huge issue. And let me tell you, it works good because I don't have anything venting it out the back and there's no like, uh, sh shadowing on my new painted wall out here in my studio. So that filter is catching everything. And uh, then you have to wear a mask, right? Um, so that would be my tip for you. Oh, here's Philip. Hey, Philip. Now he's the guy I'm playing with uh, guys for uh, Napoleonics on the 31st. Uh, he has a Grex. I've heard those are very good. Uh, bottom line is, guys, spend a little more on the airbrush. You'll have a lot less problems. Don't buy one of those cheapo master craft, whatever that garbage is. That's what I started with. I bought that kit on Amazon. Yeah, the one. It's got the airbrush. It's got the tankless compressor. Hey, it gets you got me started. It's a good introduction, but then after a while, you know, buy something nice when you get when you have the chance. Get yourself like a Badger or something. That's yes, what like this is. Or actually, no, Patriot, Patriot one hundred five. That's what I use. There's a whole bunch of them out there, um, but you know, you'll tell by the price. <laughs> um, you're very welcome, sir. It's really relaxing to listen to you. Somebody told me a long time ago I should have gone into radio. I never did though. <laughs> Maybe I should do a lawn care show, you know, yeah. answer everyone's lawn care and tree care questions uh, someday maybe, and uh, maybe make some coin off of that. Maybe, I don't know. Don't I was going to write a book. I was encouraged. One of my customers is a publisher and wanted me to write a book. Um, and that was right about the time when the internet was getting really big. We're talking early two thousands. And I'm like, look, no one's going to buy a stupid book when they get all this information for free off the internet. Right. So yeah. we never went that direction. Um, uh, la, la, la. So yeah, we're going to wrap up the show. Uh, I want to thank Stu for participating again. Uh, the next show guys we're going to do, it's either going to be the, well, no, I can't do it the day after my game because I'll be going up to Cleveland, seeing my uh, son's new apartment. And, uh, so I won't be there that day, but the following weekend, uh, probably on that Sunday, we're going to do another podcast on Napoleonic period. Um, and I will, we'll talk about some of the things we learned about our game getting into Napoleonics. And it was really interesting with Philip and I, uh, <laughs> he had all these, uh, Napoleonics. I had the starter box I built with some other kits that I had built what, three or four years ago on the channel. And I've never even played them, right? They just sat in my, in my case. Uh, so this has been an opportunity for us to dig them out. And now we're like, Hey man, we should have been playing this a long time ago. Cause this is going to be really cool. Um, the Dalton radio station has a garden talk show on Saturday, right? Yeah. Uh, we had a guy here locally. 
he was uh, doing a bunch of shows. He was a he ran a nursery. But I know more than him because I'm out in the real world. I'm dealing with the real stuff. So he just sells the plants and then I have to deal with them. Um, so, yeah, that would be something I might look into someday. I've been encouraged to do that. And I don't know if I will or not. With my second um, job, radio. Radio. I've done that for seven years. Oh, two, sweet. Or eight years now. What uh, What genre? New country. Oh, sweet. I like old country. Uh, they don't play the stuff I'd listen to, like George Jones or Merle Haggard or Hank Williams, sir, or anything like that. That's more of my stuff. It's like Merle Haggard right there. Uh, and then I got Hank Williams back here. But um, they play nice. more, more newer stuff. And I I guess I could say it on here. Nobody listens to me. Nobody's in my hometown. But it sucks because I don't I don't listen to that stuff. But you got to put on a persona. That's probably like the thing I don't like most about it is the persona. I don't like acting like I like this stuff. But anyway, I do some of the like classic rock and stuff like that. Nice. Yeah. But it's fun though. It's fun. It gets you out in the community and does you know you people know you and everything and listen to you and stuff. So we'll put a link on Discord so we can. Uh, what do you? Do they do a feed on a web somewhere or also, or is it just strictly radio waves? We're not that big. <laughs> gotcha. Not that big. Country pop music, Philip says. Yeah, it's basically pop. It's not even country anymore. You know, yeah, I'm coming from like uh, Waylon Jennings, you know, from Kentucky. We're talking uh, that's stuff yeah, country I folk. That's stuff I listen to. You know, country folk, I guess you would, could call it. Old school, you know, we're talking Loretta Lynn and yep, that's you know, we're talking hee haw and stuff, you know. Yeah, hee haw. Uh, when I was at my papa's and mamaw's house, Buck Owens and all, we watched Hee Haw on Saturday nights, yeah. right? Yeah, in Grand Old Opryland. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that's my roots, and then yeah. actually, and go, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I mean uh, I'll let everybody go. Dinner is calling me. I think we're having a pork roast with roast vegetables. Ooh, it's gonna be so good. Just one. Um, one more thing. I got these two out of antique oh, shop <laughs> in uh, uh, Gettysburg, Gene Autry, and then nice. I got yeah, this. This one's essential. You gotta get Johnny. I think Johnny. I was in that shop at one point. Really? I remember those records being out yeah. somewhere in a shop we went through? These, yeah, these are good. I'm happy I found this one. Well, that's a big comeback now, man. Is the phonographs? You yeah, know, they don't make them like they used to though. They're uh, they're more expensive and they there's they're thicker because they have uh, they they make them with more grain. If you get the originals, the uh, those records they're a lot more thinner and you know. But the sound quality, I sound quality is better in the new ones. But I like those crackling. You know, I mean, the first time I listened to my re uh, record, which was my mother's, was Scorpions. Love it. Yeah. 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 Hey, I graduated high school in 84, man. We always went to the Scorps whenever they came to Cincinnati. Yeah. Roger like a hurricane. That's a German man down there. He would like the Scorps, the old Scorps. <laughs> uh, so here he thought it's uh, mid, it's 12 p.m. there, of course. And hey, you got to be like the Hobbit, man. That's late dinner. You could go have late dinner. Yeah. If you're in New <laughs> York, man, that's when they eat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Thank you for having me on, sir. Yes, sir. You have an Thank enjoyable you. rest of your day. Yeah. I'm going to go charge charge the fortification <laughs> here when we get off. Onward ho. Yeah. Thanks, man. We'll chat. All righty. See you, everybody. <laughs>